and Ferris is back. I bought him a bunch of uh, dried cat food. And look at him go. He'll be strong as an ox soon. He might even become a bit more friendly. We'll see. Hey, Ferris! Come on, Ferris! Doesn't take to uh, calls very well at all. There we go. It's Ferris. Going to be strong soon. Last night I decided to make a whistle. It's supposed to be a flute, but it doesn't really work as a flute, it just works as a whistle. So I'm going to adapt the design. And that's out of that same rose stem. You make a little plug to go in the end. But see, I sawed it off. It worked better before I sawed it off. So these are all experiments. I just watched a YouTube video on how to make a flute. Um, and just decided to have a crack at making a flute. So I've kind of got something. None of the other holes work, you see. Anyway, there's a flute. Now, I've been busy today, so let's go and have a look at what I've been doing. Here is the house. So I'm just offering up bits of wood, so I'm going to dig out this pile of stuff, put it behind the chimney put in this one across the flat tie it into that one and then put an upright between those two and then another upright probably three uprights on that wall there and then make a stone infill so the end will be infilled with stone and then a timber upright and then all that will be clad with like um, shiplap sort of stuff old fences and things like that now I've just put in, see I've had to mash out the hazel which is a damn shame really but anyway it'll grow like I'll prune all this on the inside but it'll start to sprout out the back here and sort of grow out of there and grow out of there so hopefully this hazel will just carry on growing and it shouldn't grow in because it's going to be dark. Um, but we'll just see how that goes. I mean, it's not dead. It's a, look at the size of that root ball. It's a monster. So it's going to regrow. Um, just all depends how. So I've lit a nice big fire in here. I've got some big bits of oak from around the corner, just to like sort of dry everything out a bit because it's a nice dry day. And then I'll put up the last rafter. I wasn't going to put that one in, but when I spoke to Malcolm, he was like, "No, it's better to tie it in with the chimney." Blah blah blah. And so it was like, all right, no worries, let's get it in. So that one's in, all pegged. And now I'm going to go and get the quad and um, get the last roof panel and a bunch of this shiplap stuff. So tomorrow I can come around here, this bottom section here where the window's lent on. I'm going to put in a noggin in the middle. And then I can put cladding, and I can clad this whole section tomorrow. Um, and yeah, so that'll be the roof over there, clad that. And then it's more stonework. So I'm just doing what I can with the materials I've got until I basically run out of materials and I've got to do something else. And eventually, the roof on the other side is going to be covered in earth. And then I'm going to chuck either sedum or grass seed or something up there to make it grow so it should be a green roof hopefully but we shall see it might be too steep a pitch but it's not that steep it's about 20 degrees so I'll have to look it up but anyway rock and roll I'm gonna go get the quad
So here we are on our little jolly across the moor. We've walked from two bridges and we're going to Yelverton via Crazy Bell Pool, Bartol Reservoir. I'm tired today. I've walked a really long way. And look at it. It's just bleak. I wouldn't want to be out here in the storm. We've got beautiful sunny weather. Walking on Dartmoor. How are your boots, Jeff? At least I didn't lose it. Wow. That was walking through. That stinks of sheep shit. Yeah. <laughs> Onward. Onward. So, good evening. I'm in the caravan tonight and I'm just recording this video to make this be a lesson. Never drink water out of streams, brooks, and even spring water, because this was spring water that I drank. It was coming out of the ground, basically, and I drank it about a meter from the source. Um, and I feel ill. I was went walking across Dartmoor last weekend with my mate Jeff. We must have done, I don't know, 20 miles in a day. But we'd run out of water, so we were yomping and just saw the spring water just gushing out and thought, oh, that'll be okay. And it was fine. And then that was on Sunday. Today's Tuesday. So I stayed at my friend's house last night and kept the water in my bag and thought it's spring water. It's not going to go off. It's not going to be manky. And I got back out to the farm after staying at a friend's house last night. And I thought, oh, I'll just drink the rest of this water. There was about, oh, three quarters of a litre. Oh, I'm out of sure. Three quarters of a litre left. Anyway, within ten minutes of drinking it, my skin's pricked up. My stomach started turning over. My hair feels like it's going to fall out. And now I've got achy bones, my stomach is rough. Um, and yeah, it feels like my hair is going to fall out. I'm generally in not good shape. That was about six hours ago. Um, so let it be a lesson. Even if it looks, I mean, I've drank, to be honest, I've drank water from the River Dart, which is a big river, and I've just drank it straight out of the river. I've drank from all sorts of streams on Dartmoor and not even cared. Just thought, fine, whatever. I'll just drink it. It looks pretty good. Um, but yeah, this stuff, it looked like it was coming out of a spring. You know, an underground spring. So oh, it's going to be perfect. It's basically gushing out the ground. That was uh, like six hours ago I drank that. And I feel absolutely terrible. So let it be a lesson to you. Boil your water. Or put some bleach in it. Or get some of those purification tablets. See, I've never liked them. I've always been like a nature boy, you know what I mean? I thought, ah, oh, it'd be alright. It looks fine. Yeah, I'm really now into boiling water. So I'm going to go and get myself a little setup. When I'm on Dartmoor, I'm going to boil the water, and all that consists of is those um, solid fuel stoves, really good, and a little kettle or a pan with a lid, and just boil your water and decant it into your bottle. The day after my illness, it's about two in the afternoon. I basically only just woke up. God, I'm exhausted. Uh, the plan is today is to break these panels up into nice long lengths like this um, and then they'll be ready to clad this wall here got to do a few more things to this wall put in some noggins and the top window frame which I haven't done yet so yeah I'm just going to do some lightweight stuff to start with break up these panels <clears throat> and salvage what I can out of this timber and then burn the rest so we are back at the house just 
got in this front wall here. Obviously it's not insulated yet. And I've got to paint it with some bloody Ron seal. Something or other. But it's weatherproof. You know what I mean? Watertight. Got the... Uh, obviously I've nailed that on. So I'm starting to use more traditional fixtures and fittings now. Dug out this row of soil. That's all been put in behind there and I've put in some other stones in here. I put slate up the back of this. Infilled it with stones and put slate up there. So this is now not totally watertight. It drips a little bit but it absolutely hammered it down yesterday. And there was like a tiny little drip so I can live with that that'll be fine you know once it's all windproof and weather tight in here and I've got a roaring fire in the hearth doesn't really matter does it a couple of little drips here and there I'm not really bothered so today I'm gonna to put a massive timber across there link it in with that one underneath there and peg it at one end um, and also I'm going to concentrate on this end, finishing digging this off and then I'm going to put a layer of slate across here and then put this big long timber as a cross member across there, tie in with that one and then an upright there, infill that with stone, and an upright about there and an upright about there and then going to try and fit a window in here as well so in fact I should go and look at the window size before I put the uprights in uh, so I can so I don't mess up basically um, another thing I could do today is get the window in the front but I don't know storms coming in again for tonight so whatever I do doesn't really matter and here's the back bit that's all now nicely infilled. And where I've been walking up and down here, it's compressed it really nicely. And here's the back. So I've got to sort of continue this wall and then build the chimney up basically. I've got to get a load more stone to fill in this back bit, but another course of stone all the way up there increase that so it's got a bigger sort of area smaller hole but bigger platform area basically so still loads to do I'm getting busy this bit here is because there's air gaps in here when I light a fire the smoke comes out the back so I've decided just to put another wall up here and back fill it which should stop all the smoke coming through um, to the outside which I think will mess around with the um, with the draw of the fire as well it's um, consolidated with a nice long chimney which I'm going to put on there and you get a better draw because of the pressure differentials fingers crossed anyway that's uh, that's my idea behind it there is no theory it's all just uh, what's in my head so yeah so it's again a lot of work but got to be done Oh, the light is beginning to fade and I've got this bit in so now I've got a nice thickness on that wall there sticking that out lovely 
Now I'm going to put another bar across the front there on the inside and that will allow me then to build a stone wall into that um, and then I'm going to put, I'm going to cut lots of individual uprights going down smaller and smaller and smaller that will fill in that gap and then this will all be stonework so I'm almost at, you know, well almost, there's still loads to do but I'm getting there and I was gonna, I was planning on doing loads today, but it's just how long things take. I had to collect all the stone for that, which took an hour and a half. And I've just built it, that's taking an hour and a half, that's three hours. But bit by bit, keep on doing something, you'll get there. Alright, the storm's just about to hit. I got my dinner on. I got chapatis there, I got rice there. And this is sweet potato uh, curry, so that should be awesome. Looking forward to a munch after a hard day's work on the house. Obviously things don't go as fast as I think they're going to go. Um, so sometimes it's a lot more difficult. Uh, to get work done, you know, like, just everything takes ages, basically, I, I've got a big log I want to put in, and it's going to rain all day tomorrow, so I'm going to do college work all day, and I might have a reprieve or respite, sorry, on Monday, before it rains again on Tuesday, and then probably Wednesday and Thursday, so, you know, it's just finding the time to get things done. And winter now is definitely coming. The nights are drawing in. It must be six o'clock, probably quarter to six, and it's pr pretty dark already. On the 30th, which is in like 10 days' time, the clocks go back. So, what is six o'clock becomes five o'clock, it gets dark. Um, and then the days are really short, so it means getting up at sort of eight o'clock in the morning, starting work at eight o'clock. Which is what it is. But then midwinter, you know, start work at nine, it's just getting light at nine, finish at sort of four o'clock. So not much light. Like in the summer, I was working into the evening, up till sort of nine o'clock, I was working. Uh, but yeah, it's getting there, you know. It's funny because you do some big bits and then things start ticking over again, ticking along, like once I get this window frame in the cladding just flies up, it's easy so hopefully I'll be weather tight within the next two weeks fingers crossed good night right, the light is really fading now but you can't really make it out, I should get a torch and the storm's hitting pretty hard. Chipati and curry and rice. Awesome meal for a cold, chilly day. I'm gonna go get in the caravan and get some shut eye and see what holds tomorrow. It's gonna be raining pretty hard. Night night. Okay, we're in the centre of Hurricane Brian. I've covered up the shack a bit, but I'm continuing to do work. And I found this in the quarry because I just went for an explore. Really nice long piece of corrugated iron. It's 2.4 meters. So what I'm going to do with the corrugated iron is use it as a flashing. See, I'm more of an upcycler than anything else. Rather than primitive skills or whatnot, I just use what I've got around. So that gap there, the corrugated iron goes up over the top and then I'm going to saw this one off and saw this one off and it runs flush in with there and then it's tacked down onto these tacked coming down coming down um, but I've got more work to do on the front face first so yeah let's think about that as well but basically I've got those bits of corrugated now and it's 2.4 meters which takes me up to almost the middle of the window frame and then I've got another piece which is going to go on there. 
so you know I've just got to cut them down to length and with that I'm thinking I'm just going to use this axe and just beat them down so like that line on the thing like through there where that's really rusty and that's rusty up to there I'm going to hit that line with an axe and then I'll probably bend that off so let's see how I go just hit it with an axe it's probably very dangerous no health and safety but let's try and get some action going right that cuts clean through that very nicely indeed let's go to the other side of this last cut there we go now this edge over here Here's the panel beaten piece of corrugated iron which is going to act as my flashing and now what I've noticed is there's already holes in here previous holes you know that's quite a nice one it's got a good solid edge there's a nice little one so instead of punching new holes in it there's one two three there I'll probably have to punch a hole at that end but anyway so there's places I can go through or not now what I'm going to do with these, is because I'm punching a hole through there, I'm going to turn these into sort of little makeshift washers. Sardine tins. And what I'll do with that, is I'll fold it in half, hang on, can't get the phone straight. fold it in half you know pretty flat um, and then screw through there or nail probably through there because I'm going to nail this up and then the nail because they're nice round flat heads will just stop on there stop on there and that will spread the force so it won't rip through so easy that's the idea anyway that's the idea okay one of my interesting things to point out so I'm just tying this tarp down, I'm going to get it before it flies away. And so when you're doing anything like this, right, pulling something back on itself, like that, and you want to get that a tight knot so it's not going to loosen off loads, the best thing to do is go, God, i got to get this sorted, through the hole, again. Well, I'm doing this one-handed and filming at the same time, it's really difficult. Right, so there we go, that's gone through. Now when I pull that up, it'll tighten, but it won't loosen off almost, you know, it won't loosen off at all almost. So now like with one hand, I can just chuck a half hitch on there and tighten that down. <laughs> you know what I mean? It hasn't gone anywhere. And that's just from doing the second round on there. And then... Okay got this bit in didn't bend round as I thought it might which is slightly annoying um, but anyway 
I can just clad all the way up to the inside of there now and then just put slates coming down from there so that's you know this is my club made out of a bit of hazel but it's very good nice little tool to use rather than metal just for chiseling on wood and it doesn't damage the end of your tool so much go little window so needs to come out this end a little bit perfect I'm gonna get a little piece of glass um, make a little frame probably hacks all that off but if I can go around it I'll probably go around it so we, this is what I've put in today this big one goes all the way across here so now what I do is in, in these gaps, put uprights in there, lots of them, all the way along, a quarry. This place now fills me with dread, because I know every time I come in here, I'm going to have to carry like, I'll probably just finish that off with another 50 stones, and look where the stones are all the way over there and that's a swamp and there's my pile of stone pretty tired so I'm going to sit down now this was a brand new jacket about a month ago oh dear. this is what's really doing my nut in today Just got my chimney and I'm trying to get busy and I'm surrounded by hornets. They're too quick to film, but they're literally everywhere. They're on a bonkers mission. I'm actually getting out of here. So I was just about to um, clay in the chimney. But I can't even go outside because there are hundreds and hundreds of hornets about. Like, there are hundreds. So I think I'm going to just, I can't even go out there. As soon as I go outside, I get swamped by hornets. So it's impossible for me to work. Well, here's the chimney installed. As with everything I do, it's not square. It's not level. But it's quite a nice long chimney. Now what I'm going to do is clay all that in, get it to a nice level, and then... So getting this fireplace to effectively draw is really difficult. As you can see if I film from this angle, and you can see that smoke's coming back inside, which is damn annoying. Um, I don't know what to do now. I've got a massive chimney, so that should create quite a good stack effect, like back pressure type thing. So the only thing I can think of is to reduce the size of this orifice, i.e. inducing more pressure to be dragged across it. Now I can do that in a few ways, I can block up this bit here, so build up in behind there block that off so it just makes the whole thing smaller and even put in another lintel lower down um, and just make the orifice a lot smaller all really annoying really tedious um, you know I've never built a fireplace before maybe I should have looked into the physics of it a bit more before just bunging it together you know, but, you know, I'm very much a trial and error sort of person, so i just throw it together and see how it goes. So right now, 
I'm really pretty ticked off with this. These are tales from the spam yard. This tale is about a man called Adam Meats. Now Adam Meats wanted to be the fattest man in the world. From a young age he used to read the Guinness Book of Records and he always dreamed about being the fattest man in the world. <laughs> He had a wife called No Lean Meats. They met whilst at a catering convention. Of course, Adam Meats used to go to catering conventions to work out how to feed large amounts of people because he could eat enough food for a large amount of people. Adam Meats generally would eat 20,000 calories a day. Now his wife, Nolene Meats, was a school dinner lady and cook. She would cook school dinners and they met at a catering conference and she would feed him every day with enough to feed a small school. They had all the stainless steel kitchen fitted and she had all the equipment she needed to feed Adam to reach his goal of being the fattest man in the world. Now Adam got so big that he was bedridden, he couldn't leave his bed. But he was a lucky man, you see because a few years previously he had won the lottery so Adam Meats was a million millionaire he won 11.6 million pounds on the lottery before that he had a dream and on this lottery win he could make his dreams come true and so he started visiting catering conferences where he met his wife. And he fitted out the kitchen with all the best stainless steel gear going. Gas hobs. Double ovens. Five double ovens. Ten gas hobs. So she could cook large amounts of food and cater for a small army. Now one day she was carrying this large amount of food up the stairs when she slipped on a banana skin -dum -dum fell down the stairs and broke her neck. That was the end of Nolene Meats. Adam was mortified. He laid in his bed, he screamed, he wailed, Nolene, Nolene, where are you? There was no reply. Adam had a lot of technology around him. His smart TV, his mobile phone, his internet uplink, and laptop computers, voice activated, email, voice activated, almost everything. So he rang 999 and the police came round. But there was a quandary. Adam is bedridden. What's he going to do? No one can feed him anymore. He's stuck in his bed. And he started to worry then he was going to start losing weight. He only had another four stones before he would have been the fattest man in the world. Now to get Adam Meats out of his house they had to take the roof off his house this took a very concerted effort by an engineering team he also at this time employed the local Chinese restaurant to continuously cook food and serve him they were overjoyed because they were making lots of money now out of Adam Meats 
and he was very upset because he loved his wife even though they had never been intimate that was impossible they loved each other now whilst taking the roof off his house Adam Meets saw a bright young engineer and he got chatting to him and he said what right, I'd mate now listen to me I want to become the fattest man in the world can you help me out and the engineer was called Max Stone he said of course I can help you out will you pay me he said I'll, I'll pay you I'll double the wage I'll double the wages you're on it's your current employment no problem so he employed Max Stone the engineer young bright engineer as his right hand man in his quest they had to crane Adam Meats out of his house and construct a steel chassis to carry his prone body in fact his supine body out of his house he was put onto the back of a truck into a cargo freighter and sent to a new bungalow which he had bought and he had sold his house and bought a bungalow where it's far more practical for him to continue his quest now Max Stone the bright young engineer had devised a machine a feeding machine because he knew that Adam Meats wanted to be the fattest man in the world so he devised a machine to feed him he had everything he needed and he could up his calorie intake to 30,000 calories a day it also came with excretion facilities and waste disposal units in his new house Adam had employed Max Stone to equip it with the latest in data communication and he had a YouTube uplink where he could upload his latest blogs now Adam Meats was now only five pounds away from becoming the fattest man in the world he would be in the Guinness Book of Records for eternity as being the largest man ever to have lived on planet Earth this excited Adam greatly he wanted it he needed it this was his life's journey coming to its pinnacle now Max Stone realized that Adam's health was suffering greatly due to this massive calorie intake and he had heart monitors rigged up and he realized that his heart was going to fail at some point and he told Adam about this and he said it doesn't matter if I die the day after I become the fattest man in the world it does not matter so they kept the machine going five pounds to the record four pounds to the record three pounds to the record two pounds to the record at two pounds to the record Adam realized he could eat as much food as he wanted and then he decided he would ring the records agency and the next day they would come round and weigh him at this point he had completely lost any comprehension of an outside life this was his life he was connected by a machine to the internet he was connected by a machine to eat food he was connected by a machine to excrete waste products he was bedridden but he would be the largest man on earth so he decided he was going to eat lead weights 
in his food for the next two days. He had two days before the inspector came round to weigh him. And Adam had devised a bed which had scales already built in. So he could press a button and the weight of him would come up and tell you how much he weighed. So he decided to eat behind Max Power's back a load of lead balls. And he only had two pounds. So he swallowed a one ounce weight with his food. He swallowed another one ounce weight. That evening... Adam Meats swallowed 32 one ounce fishing weights. When the day came, he was pounds and pounds over the heaviest man in the world. He had achieved his goal. Max Powers. Max Stone, sorry, Max Stone, came round and he said, Adam, how did you do that? He said, ha ha, I have a little trick up my sleeve. I ate lead weights. He said, you do realise you're going to die of lead poisoning. It doesn't matter. I am the fattest man that ever lived. Mm -hmm.